Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, listeners, and anybody who tunes in, especially for the Saturday session with Stephen. Guess what? Here he is again. And this time he's wearing a, a little bit of an elaborate Hawaii-style shirt. So, Stephen, obviously there's uh, something going to be a little bit more expressive in today's feedback and comments. I'm looking forward to it. How are you? Thanks, Chris. Good morning or good afternoon from Malaysia. Yeah, actually, I thought I'd take a leaf out of your, your not your book, but a leaf out of your wardrobe. I found a bit of cloth that, that, was, uh, that was very fitting in Chris Lotter's style, and um, here I am today. But I want to touch on some news from the Caribbean today, so I thought I'd try to try to without being... Um, like, so I, might, I might have got the, uh, the content... Well, I got the content right, probably, but, um, but the, uh, the style a bit wrong. But there we go. That's my mission. I'm trying to get everybody to bring those shirts back. And my shirt is for alert and awareness... Because mm -hmm. um, certain things that I've seen as well now are starting to uh, fall off a little bit. So I think we need a little bit of a reboost. So anyhow, good bit of news because we're always, we're always focusing on plan positive. And I've got one question from Debbie today who quite rightly says, more job losses, more job losses, more job losses. How can you and Steve keep talking about plan positive? So we'll come to that a little bit later. But one good bit of news is for... Um, Someone that we know very well, Tim Strauss, who's now taken over the CEO position of Amerijet, um, which is fantastic. So, brilliant. Well done. Well done, Tim. Now, Steve, where do you want to start, my friend? Busy week, I think. Um, lots of news. I think, um, oh, to Debbie's point, straight away, I guess, look, uh, it's not going to stop. Um, I think the, you know, we will continue to, to see the um, the impacts uh, you know on livelihoods um, for quite some time to come. Um, so I think Debbie is right to be concerned. I guess what what we've been trying to do is 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 find the positives. These little green shoots that exist in a sea of in a sea of very tragic, very difficult news and very personally impactful uh, decisions that are being made by business. Um, but let's but let, let's understand why that is. I guess you know I was I was on a call this week with a with a client, um, a government client, and uh, we were having a conversation uh, about kind of you know what 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 happens when the support network or the support systems that have been put in place by government stop. So in Australia you've got JobKeeper, and in the UK you've got job retention schemes, etc., yeah. and and equivalent around the world. So, you know, a lot of those schemes have been announced by, by, by the respective ministries or governments that, that, that they'll, be, they'll be halted when it comes to the end of August, end of September, or they'll be reduced in, in size and scale. Um, and there's a massive, massive worry now, of course, that the support that has been available universally um, is being pulled. So it's nice to get people. I've just been to the dentist uh, for the first time in about nine months. I normally go for a six-monthly people to check up and, and scale and polish. Not that that personal information is relevant to our listeners. What's relevant is the fact that I was able to go to a dentist. Um, uh, you obviously didn't manage to get to a clothes shop yet with that bright orange shirt on, but I'm sure you'll get to the, to the retail outlets very soon, given that they're now open. Restaurants yes, are now sir. open, pubs are now open. And, and so we're starting to see a reopening of business and economy, for the most part, you know, generally quite globally. Of course, there are still issues in in um, in uh, you know places like India, Brazil, etc., Australia, have some spikes again, so clong back down. The relevance to our industry is, is quite simple. As we start to reopen society and reopen economy, and you know people want to start to be able to spend and discretional spend becomes available to them again. They want to get out and get some sense of normality back in their lives. They'll want to travel. The problem with wanting to travel now, of course, is that as these other businesses are opening up. What that's doing is government is saying, well, yeah, yeah that's all right. We're, we're starting to open up so we can, reduce the, we can reduce the reliance on the taxpayer to support businesses uh, uh, you know, across, the, across the, the, um, uh, the board. And what we'll do is we'll start to pull this, this, this taxpayer fund of support. As that's being pulled and other businesses are, are, are able to pay their employees, they're able to fund them again because they've got business and they've got, they've got revenue going to the system. Airlines still don't. People are still not traveling because there's been a big push by many governments on domestic travel. Um, uh, here in, here in, in, in Malaysia, where I am, big push in domestic travel. In the UK, big push in domestic travel. Within the Schengen area, big push in domestic travel. So that means that people are now not, you know, unless you've got large domestic markets like the US, um, yeah. Canada geographically, and then but you look at large geographical markets like Australia, which are still locked down. 
you know, people are not going to go back to airlines. So this is a problem. And so unless there, is, there are now bespoke solutions available for the travel sector and the airline community specifically, or the airline, airline uh, uh, business, including the supply chain, we're going to have more of these job losses, sadly, to come, Debbie. And, 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 and so a lot of the work that I'm doing, and we're doing, we're doing it for, you know, because we're fully vested in this, not, 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 not for, not for or, you know, other reasons, but because we want to support uh, getting our, 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 our industry and our peers and our colleagues back up, speed back at the business. So trying, trying to help governments and, 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 and industry develop this to present and propose stuff to, to, or to lobby government for additional support is going to be really important in the next few months because when those taps are turned off, Chris, it, it might even get worse again. I, well, Steve, I've been saying there's, a, there's an, another question, which is from Denzel, which is why, why open up so much now when everybody knows there's going to be so much more problems in the future? And this is something I've been saying and, and not being negative about it because people should have learned from the first wave. But the second wave is definitely coming. You look at what's happening, the, Im the immense spikes now in the States, and then you look at India as well. It, things are really, really going crazy. Now, you have been an advocate of opening up, and quite rightly so, to allow the economy to grow a little. But I think at the end of the day now, what's happening is all businesses, all, co all governments, all companies, they've only got so much money. And now what they're trying to do is get as much more in as they possibly can so that they can get themselves for March or April next year. Now, with that in mind, and I agree with you, that you know we've got to start looking at things a little bit more differently now, and even to the point of moving from crisis to care, because people are responding, um, just like we've said now, with job losses. And if you look at BA, the 747 aircraft, I mean, my goodness, you know, 30 aircraft now are going to be retired so early when it was planned for, I think it was 23 or 24. 24, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, to have that, and, and you, you've been aviation a long time, you know, me as well, but the, the 747 from cargo perspective has always been the workhorse. And it's been in, in so many people's minds as, as such a unique experience when they got on a 747. And it's, it's sad in one way, but it's understandable in the other. But if you look at the number, if you look at the number of, the, of airlines around the world, you know, that have got 747s, which will probably start doing the same, you know, taking the same sort of action. I think it's 70 or 71 carriers worldwide operating around 500 of, of those particular version aircraft. I mean, that's an awful lot of equipment well, that probably will go. And then you've got all the crews and all the businesses associated with supporting an aircraft like that, wherever it lands or takes mm -hmm. off. It's going to be incredible, Steve. Well, it, it, look, it absolutely is. So personally, it's very sad. I've been very fortunate to fly on multiple 74s and multiple airlines and sat in every cabin, um, uh, uh, including crew rest, actually. Um, so from, you know, first through to economy and crew rest. And, and, and uh, look, uh, it's my favourite aircraft. I thought that, that Rolls-Royce powered um, uh, 744 was a, was a super machine. And um, I know Doug Brown, uh, 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 who, of course, um, works, works with at Skylight. He was a as well as being the chief pilot of British Airways, he was a 7-4 skipper for many years. And um, I know talking to him yesterday, of course, it's very, it's very sad, but not unexpected, Chris. Um, but if you think how well that aircraft has stood the test of time. So yep. British Airways were the world's largest operator of the 747. And uh, until recently, I think they had 33, 34 aircraft, but they retired a couple uh, uh, prior to this. So it's about 30, yep. right? They're, they're retired in now. Um, compare that for an aircraft that's been in service fundamentally since the 60s, essentially, uh, or designed since the 60s, and, and, and an aircraft, the 744, that's been in service in British Airways for 25 something years. Compare that to its nearest and dearest neighbor in terms of scale, the A380, that it's already been retired prior to COVID by airlines. So it's already been retired by Singapore Airlines um, before, yep. before COVID. And so they were getting rid of arguably the earlier deliveries and replacing them with the, with with new deliveries. But but they were you know those those losses for Airbus came as a massive blow. So of course, trying to redeploy this aircraft is really important for Airbus. But they they they've really not succeeded in the same way that Boeing did. Boeing Boeing built a beautiful airplane. Um, you and I on, only two weeks ago were talking about you know payload capability and what aircraft do we need? Well, it, it was it was straight onto the jumbo. We knew the jumbo was the man for the job and some other conversations that you and I were having about some work. And the jumbo has always been iconic, not just I think for people in the industry, but also the also the travelling, the travelling public. So, um, you know, the queen um, of the skies, Steve, the queen, queen of the skies. skies. It is very sad news. Um, 
I suspect, however, look, the, uh, as we as we've seen with with the with the agility of the industry to switch from you know Pax aircraft and freighter to freighter, there may well yep. be some life in life in these old girls yet. And so let's hope that um, somebody somebody picks them up. But I suspect when there's a lot of two you know two engine uh, dual engine aircraft on the market that can that can do you know reasonably you know uh, uh, reasonably sh shift payload not to the same extent as a jumbo, then I suspect that the unit costs and the, and the costs of keeping the jumbo flying will, will outweigh the benefits. But very yep. sad, very sad times indeed. That is indeed. And, and I just coming back to the reference of the 747 being the queen of the skies. And then if the, if the, uh, if the 380 is, um, is the king of the skies, it just goes to show a queen normally lasts longer than a king. Queen always trumps king, Chris. There you go. Hey. But, but it is, it's, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge shame. Now, that's also now going to question the strategy of some of the larger carriers, especially the hub-focused carriers, on, on whether or not they were right to go for so many large capacity aircraft. Well, look, I mean, I guess if you're referring to, to the carrier, I think you are, Emirates in Dubai, um, uh, you know, an all wide body fleet, unlike its, um, unlike its nearest, nearest next door in Abu Dhabi, who's, who's, you know, had migrated to narrow bodies many, many years ago, as you know, when you were, when you were in that part of the world. I think, um, look, I mean, I, I, I don't want to sort of, you know, speak too much about the economics, but the, the, the reality was the only carrier that was, that certainly would seem to be able to make the A380 work because of the scale and because of the hub uh, and because of that, 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 that operation that Emirates ran. Was 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 EK? Uh, you know, uh, Qantas have struggled. Um, you know, SQ have already, as I said, exited aircraft from the fleet. Um, you know, TG haven't done very much with theirs. The aircraft were never big in the states. I mean, the American Airlines never, 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 never bought an uh, an, uh, uh, an Air 380, as far as I was aware. Um, you know, done a reasonably okay in North Asia, but, but but the one that seems to stand out for me is is as being as, as being the 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 sort of the flagship example of where they think his work is emirates and um yeah. uh, they seem they seem to have said they've stayed committed to the a380 in fact the a380 operated ek1 i think it was on wednesday this week um from dubai back into london so that's them refunding the a380s again and just as emirates are doing that Qantas are flying their aircraft to the desert to park them up at the a380 fleet so so i think yep. that's 12 of their a380s that won't be utilized so you know it is Let's see what happens. I suspect, as we know already, next generation, you know, twin engine aircraft is the is the way forward. That's where the economics exist. When you get when you get the kind of endurance that you can from the from the three fifties and the seven eights, I think that's probably probably the the way. Yeah, the yeah, and and the combination of everything. Not even the future. Said. It was the way of the current. I mean, it, that was the way it was going yeah. already. But economically wise and environmentally wise, it's uh, it's definitely going to go that way. Now, another another sad bit of news as well is Cathay and with, with their anticipation of uh, some something like 10 billion Hong Kong dollars half year net loss. And then they themselves have got 50 aircraft in storage and the group itself, you know, making such huge losses is such a shame as well. Yeah, I also see that they've got some board pressure. Um, the Hong Kong government has has um, has has placed two observers this yep. week onto the Cathay Pacific board. I'm not sure what kind of parlance that is, um, a board observer from the Hong Kong government. Um, but I suspect that the, that the Hong Kong government is after, after some scrutiny capability, uh, uh, <laughs> um, you know, given that they helped with the, um, with the funding and the, and the short, -term, short term funding requirements and equity position that they took. So um, anyway, that will cause some 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 trouble there. I suspect we all know how Hong Kong, how politically sensitive that is as well. An area yep. that we should stay well and clear from on this podcast. I suspect uh, you are a hundred percent right. Hence the T-shirt, Stephen. So whenever we stray into a, a little area of uh, sensitivity, gonna, this well, you, this is to warn is to warn us both. Steer clear. Steer clear. Now, I, Unlike the red shirts or yellow shirts of our, our friends just up the road out of here. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Now, American Airlines, another. And again, for anybody listening, this isn't a roll call of doom and gloom, but it's just so that this, this news gets out there so that everybody can then start looking at what do we do with what's left. So the American, American Airlines, 25,000 employees, pending job losses. 
You know, it's uh, and, and what you were saying is, and, and a lot of that is because of the reality of the US federally funded payroll support program running out. On the first of October. Exactly. And, and I, th I think we will see a bit more of that, Chris. And that's really sad. But look, that's the reality um, for many people. And that's the reality that many people that have worked for these businesses for so long, you know, put their, put their blood, sweat and tears into it and really, really, you know, being faithful, loyal employees through no fault of their own. But also, yeah. let's remember, through no fault of their firm. Um, nobody has, nobody has kind of, you know, asked for this. Not one company, not one airline, not one airport, well, not one travel business, not one retailer uh, ever could have, um, you know, wished for something like this to affect us in the way it has done. So we just need to be remember, you know, remember always that um, that that the, you know, this is not something that um, that businesses are trying to 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 use as uh, as an excuse or a lever to drive change. This yep. is fundamentally about survival. Yeah. Um, and that's not about survival today or tomorrow because taking those very short term views where you could, oh, we might get through until next month, the cover doesn't come back, we could, we could exit, you know, so many employees, we can take out 100 employees by, you know, October, maybe that'll see us through. This is actually about survival for the next one, two, three years plus. So exactly. unfortunately, unfortunately, the cuts are deep. The cuts are much harder. The cuts are much tougher than employees might expect. Business doesn't want this. I, 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 I you know, this is not something that, that, that has been preordained. This is something that comes at great cost to the shareholders. So employees are very well vested, but shareholders are very well vested. And shareholders have got to, stack, to step up right now as well. The problem with a lot of travel business, of course, is shareholders have got multiple uh, 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 investments and equity positions in businesses that are all affected by, yep. by, by COVID-19. Whether it's the retail sector, it's the leisure sector, it's the travel sector, uh, anything with discretional spend. So it's very easy to criticise your shareholders or your 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 you know guys that have been there for a long time and say, well, these these fellows should pump in the cash. Simply put, this is not about this is the, you know if they had the cash, I'm sure they would. So I just think I just think we've got to always remember that, that that everybody's well, you know, no chairman of the board or no board director on a on a non exec board wants to ever sit there and think about you know how you know they deliver a message or how they the business survives by losing tens of thousands of employees. That 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 decision for the board, the AMR, you know, for, for the American Airlines own owner group, group AMR, must must have, must be horrendous. And everybody else is the same boat. So my heart also goes out to them as well. No, hundred percent, hundred percent, Steve. And at the end of the day, nobody, not the scientists, not so-called experts, government, nobody anticipated the effects of this, and and are still are still at loggerheads with each other as to understand exactly where it's going and why. So, you know, it's, it's very difficult just, just for people who are running an organization or a company or a corporation to have any better understanding or intelligence than, you know, than the great minds of the scientists. So, I mean, this is just, it's crazy. But again, coming back to plan positives, anybody now, the, 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 next, the next six to nine months are going to be so, so, so tough. So everybody should start getting their, 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 own, their own act in order, their own, their own uh, affairs in order as best and as quickly as possible because it is going to be a very tough winter. Ryanair, another sad thing. A, a thousand island to UK flights yeah. cancelled. And Steve, we've spoken about this 14-day quarantine and, and, and how you know, it, it was unfair with Portugal. Now with Ireland, very close to my heart. I mean, it's ridiculous. I, I, look, I mean, I've been, we, we praise Ryanair, um, you know, uh, alongside, you know, the likes of Wizz Air for, for being fairly resilient and, you know, getting back some capacity to the market early, getting some messaging out there to the customers. <coughs> I think Ryanair by far has dealt with the customers, you know, reasonably well and, you know, being pretty, pretty yep. fair and their refunds process and their credit shows. I had some that were dealt with within 48 hours. Um, uh, you know, through the normal customer care channel. So I think, you know, they've done pretty well. I think what 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 we were hoping for was that Ryanair putting all that capacity back into the market um, in July and August was a sign that we were onto onto some something good. Um, well, all this all those flights now come out of out the schedule in August again, and uh, that obviously tells you that there is a problem with with confidence uh, still. Yeah. Uh, people are not booking that we thought that, that, that might book or if they are booking um, you know I suspect that they are booking but they're booking for schedules maybe winter some winter ski or winter sun or summer 2021 as of course the airlines have released a lot of capacity now in 2021 to get some cash back through the back through the system 
So that's very sad news. And um, I, I know, uh, you know, Ryanair is a very, very well run organization. And, um, you know, they, they take a lot of flack, I think, from customers a lot of the time. But I think for those in industry, we would often say Ryanair is a, is a, is a yeah, stellar, model, yeah. stellar example of how to run an airline from a from a from a from a from an operational business commercial shareholder perspective. Um, so if they're making these tough decisions, Chris, I'm sure it's going to hurt others much much more. So I suspect, yeah. I suspect that there may be there may yet be others to fall, and and that yeah. would be a sad sad thing. But, but again, 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 it also comes down to a bit of influence or a bit a bit of impact from this. You know, the 14 day quarantine. And especially to some of the countries in the EU, in the EU, which have got even you know lower rates. So, from government perspectives, again, you know this this quarantine and should you shouldn't you? It's uh, it's a big dilemma. Yeah. I'm not sure that's uh, look. I mean, uh, you know, uh, the, the way that politicians generally change policy is through pressure. So, you know, I think the I think the UK airlines groups have done some some pretty pretty good work and some very good lobbying. Um, Bar has done some work on this. The AOA has done some work on this. Uh, I think we're all going to keep the pressure up. I think, yep. um, uh, you know, I think if, if if the government cannot produce to to industry or indeed to the select committee, uh, you know, that are questioning the logic of these decisions, or indeed to parliamentarians that are asking the question, then 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 you know, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure they've got a leg to stand on because if that. If that scientific evidence does not exist, or there is no there is no scoring matrix about how do you end up on this list versus this list, then yeah. then, then I think it makes a mockery of the whole bloody system, quite frankly. So, um, you know, I suspect that if we push them to present some evidence and there is no evidence, the cards will fall, um, and I think we'll get some 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 sensibility. Uh, of course, the problem is these quarantine decisions are not always um, on medical science; they're about politics. Yep, yep, no, exactly, exactly. Now, some good news for, for two organisations, so and, and, and two that I know very well. Menzies Aviation and Qatar Airways uh, Cargo announcing an agreement um, whereby Menzies are going to be taking over the handling. So, obviously, Menzies must be over the moon with that because I think it's going to be one of the biggest um, dedicated warehouse capacities that they've got, something around 7,000 square square meters so they're going to be over the moon so i we've just we just did a podcast with mervyn walker i think we've got one coming up with robert fordry and obviously i know chrissy veal very well so i think they're all going to be over the moon with that particular contract steve oh, look, I think, uh, sorry I, I was slightly distracted there i i've got a new puppy chris as you know so, so for our listeners my puppy was deciding to just um Make use of the facilities uh, in my office. Yeah, um, so apologies for the distraction. So there'll be some cleaning up to do afterwards, huh? Indeed. Uh, look, good news for Menzies. I, 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 look, I, I mean, these these are good wins to get, Chris. I suspect that we know that there'll be some there'll be some discussions about stop, start, continue. Um, you know, or you know, fix, close, sell for some businesses um, that that. You know, airlines might not reopen stations, gun handlers might not reopen stations, gun handlers might look to do deals or consolidation or, you know, find find some potentially collaborative collaboration, you know, maybe between the smaller gun handlers across the region to try to get some some scale and share some of those those um, that IP or collective contract capability. Um, so I think, you know, whilst there, there'll be some movement, um, there'll also be some consolidation that creates opportunities for people. So a lot yep. of the fellas that maybe have, have lost their jobs or, you know, been squeezed out through no fault of their own. Um, maybe there are some opportunities like this, Chris, that come up that folks can, can stick their hand up in. And, and um, you know, and I, I've seen a few jobs advertised. I've, you know, actually, um, as Heathrow World Cargo at the um, Cargo Center, I saw, I saw a key account manager post this week. I saw some other jobs this week. I saw some jobs in Singapore. I saw Malaysia airports are recruiting. Uh, Malaysia Airlines are recruiting. So, it, you know, despite there being some some uh, you know mostly filled with bad news it's important that we just remember there are some little little nuggets out there and um you know if people want to take a bit of a punt to want to 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 look around well enough and i said i you know you, you and i you and i've always i've got, I've got a, a, a ear relatively close to the guy and we won't certainly won't be able to help everybody affected by this but if we can help if we can help some of the some of the younger guys who the, the you know so the start of their careers who maybe have been you know, less than sort of time served, if you like, then 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 I think that's that's right and fair for people like us to do that, Chris, as well. 
I hundred percent, and and um, something hopefully that that maybe we'll be able to talk about next week or a week after. A little initiative that's been sent off to a couple of uh, large representative organisations to see if they're supportive of of something that we're going to drop. Like I say, hopefully next week or a week after, Steve. Um, another positive though, with with some of these changes and and something that um, Guilam, hello from uh, I say hello, hello. He'll, he'll go mad now with the way I've pronounced his surname from um, Qatar. But he's he's a very, very powerful speaker and a very, very sensible man. And um, he's now focusing so much more on values and customer centricity, etc. So I think overall, you know, some of these changes, there's going to be an awful lot more focus on the customer to, to sort of embrace loyalty and, and reflection of what's necessary for the customer. So in some ways, this sort of cleanup of the industry will be a positive as well. Yeah, for sure. I, look, I think, um, as we said before, look, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of good that can come from from a crisis. Um, if that helps shape the tree in terms of contracting standards or redressing the balance across the supply chain, creating much more of an equilibrium and a fair and representative, you know, share of the pot. Um, you know, if that helps us, you know, sort of develop better ways of working. We spoke about digitalization and you know paperless environments and. Yeah. Um, Mr. Ambridge will be listening out, so Dave will give you a shout out again because I know that you're championing this cause for 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 um, for electronic airway bills and removing all the paper in the system. I know you spoke to Mervyn about that the other day, Chris, on on the podcast this week. Um, you know about about trying to help these companies, you know, uh, or use COVID as a as a as a as a platform to remove some of that 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 bureaucracy and crap from our from our from our archaic systems. I still want that CETA bloody printer, dot matrix printer to move from the gate. That's my biggest pet hate. So I know a lot of our listeners out there from the airports, the ground handling community, will hear that drrr, 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 as the yeah, 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 462 pay, two line passenger manifest is printed out twice yeah, in triplicate. Yeah. Yeah. It's just nonsense. You know, we, we, I think we've all seen some good news this week in the, um, in the you know, so that's from the commercial perspective and some, some of the sort of, you know, more sort of uh, aspirational stuff. There are also some good news this week around some of the, the screening capability and um, uh, some of my colleagues at a company, some of, some of the guys might look called Simply Flying, um, run by a, a, a very smart uh, fellow, Shashank Nigam. Shashank you know, does a lot of, sort of digital marketing and, and customer-based marketing and solutions for airline community. And, yeah. um, and what he's been doing is running a lab with multiple vendors from around the globe around actually providing something new into this, into injecting some new technology and keep it into the system as a result of this this COVID crisis but really he's built a team there with with you know partners who are sponsoring it and funding and uh, and potential acquirers so airports and airlines of the systems but also also um also an expert panel of 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 um you know, sort of reviewers of the capability i'd just like to say there's some of that good stuff coming through the system that we don't always hear about but if you look up simply flying and see the work that they're doing sort of you know to incubate some of this new Technology, with it, whether it's on passenger screening, it's on biohealth um, uh, uh, screening, or it's on it's on you know paperless paperless travel and and, and digitization. That's something that you should you should look out for. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna try. I'm thinking of creating the the Ambridge Charter um, as as the title for the project to try and get rid of so much of this paper. That that will please Dave. Now another good bit of news, and also a question that came from Tim. He he was talking about drones. And about how effectively is investment and the development of drones so that when vaccines do come that you know there might be able to be drops and that also um, comes in line with a, a piece of news that came out from uh, two organizations trip and co and wings for aid talking about how they're going to be able to drop vaccines out of yeah, drones yeah. from 100 100 meters height steve in in self with, without with parachutes in self yeah self landing 20 kilo cardboard boxes I mean that's that's incredible, and and that really is something that that could be done, and especially if there's going to be more isolation in the future. Mm. Yeah, I haven't seen that. I I must look that up. Um, I've got um, my problem in my just beyond my back garden. There's a small there's a small forest, small uh, jungle, and um, uh, there's a there's a there's a there's a pack of monkeys live there. So I'm not sure if my parcel will be delivered by drone. That, that some of these um, some of these monkeys might come and collect my my parcel, so I'll be careful what I order. 
exactly. A dozen, a dozen tenants might not, might not, might not be suitable. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And now, when, I mean, some, some, some people would say good news. Some people would say bad news. With something that I'm going to bring up in a minute. But before that, Budapest Airport welcoming growing passenger numbers and new routes. So again, we keep we keep referencing with Wiz, and obviously this is good news for all there as well. Well, look, great news. Um, uh, you know, uh, I think the Central Europe, Central Eastern European market is interesting, Chris, because a lot of a lot of the travel around that region is is much more, uh, you know, VFR, and yep. um, and so we suspected that that you know during during some of this, the the um, economic forecasts that were done by IATA, KO, and others, um, we always saw that VFR would tend to come back first, uh, yep. followed by leisure. And then, so you know, business, business at the bottom of the bottom of the tree. Uh, as we become all more used to working on Zoom and Skype and MS Teams and oh goodness knows what else. But uh, but 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 VFR travel around Central Europe is important, and we know from markets like Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Slovenia, Lithuania that there's there's a lot of that market around. So I'm not surprised to hear that Budapest is is, is seeing that. Exactly. And now the one I was saying, there's been a lot of lot of bad publicity or, or not, not the kindest of publicity with regards to Branson's Virgin Atlantic um, problems and looking for rescue deals and referring to his personal um, wealth. But it looks like now that they're close to unveiling a £1.2 billion uh, pound equivalent Sky News, um, which has reported this bailout. So, you know, at... Whether you whether you love him, whether you don't, the man has put so much into the industry and he's opened up so much and he was so innovative at the in the early days with regard to customer experience. It would be a shame if, if they didn't continue. I think Virgin Virgin is Virgin the Virgin brand, I suspect for a lot of people is a bit like a bit like Marmite. Um for those not aware of what Marmite is or Vegemite, it's um it's sort of you you, you, you either love or love it. I think Branson is a bit of a Marmite character, Chris. Um, yeah. I think the, prob the problem is twofold. One is, um, and, and I touched on it, so I, you know, I'm going I'm to sort of defend my own case here, but then contradict myself, uh, is, is these shareholders you know, are not sitting with bank accounts, with, with lots of cash, just sitting there yeah. doing nothing. They, they yeah. are, they are, it's paper wealth for the most part. They're not, they're not cash liquid. So when everybody's questioning, saying, well, why isn't Branson putting it in? You know, why should the taxpayer be after? Why should anybody else be after? Branson should fund it. He's apparently worth four billion quid. Yep. Actually, Branson didn't have the cash. And he was so highly leveraged, I suspect, as well as other businesses. And yes. so I touched on that earlier, so I won't be on that road again. The second thing also I would say is it's very difficult for an airline like Virgin Atlantic to seek UK taxpayer funds. Because for the most part, um, Virgin Atlantic is a leisure carrier that takes customers out of the United Kingdom. And it takes them to holiday destinations where right now they didn't have to go and they could go and discretionary spend is lovely. And the government, of course, gets gets APD uh, benefit out of that. And it creates a whole lot of other systems in the UK. But um, it's a large employer, arguably. But it's taking customers for the most part, there's the old exception, but for the most part to the Caribbean, to the US uh, on holiday to spend their money in other countries. And actually, when you, when, you, when, you, when you look at the difference between British Airways asking for a commercial-based loan or EasyJet asking for a commercially-based loan, EasyJet being the de facto business carrier of, of, of Europe now, I guess, you know, in countries of British Airways, but, but those carriers bring a lot into the United Kingdom. And therefore, yep. it's much easier for the, for the government to, to support because actually they can see, they can see yeah, that yeah, return. The Easy, EasyJet, yeah. Ryanair, British Airways are hugely profitable. Virgin Atlantic, I suspect, hasn't paid corporation tax in a very long time. And therefore, whilst it might have employee tax contributions, or whatever, and I'm not excusing the, the, great, the great value of, of, of Virgin Atlantic and, and the brand that brand, brands created, but when government only has a finite amount of cash, Chris, they've got to use it very, very carefully. And therefore, they make sure that they get, they get some return on it. Arguably a commercial loan, but a commercial loan that would have come with great risk, uh, because was that a viable business before the yep. COVID-19 yep. event? So yep. look, hats off to, to them. They seem to have pulled it through. I don't really believe the way it's structured. I think there's some opaqueness around that. Deferral of shareholders and related party fees seems a bit odd. That they would, yes, yes. So it's not, it's not a cash injection. But anyway, who am I? I'm not an economist or a finance or an accountant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just a... I'm just a uh, but just what, a, you are, what you are, Steve, is you, you, you put a little bit of clarity and a little bit of the why into those particular questions. And I think that's also, that's also something that 
that governments and, and, and media, they should spend more time focusing on the why and making people understand rather than just being yeah. negative and throwing out the emotional argument that people, they love to surf across the sea of negativity. It's, a, it's such a shame. Terrible. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, I'm sure a lot, a lot, like a lot of Virgin Atlantic customers would love to surf in Cancun on their holidays, spending money in Mexico, as welcome as that is. Most, you know, the, the government is not there to support their, their holiday activity, they have to support the, the United Kingdom exchequer. Yeah, yeah, people. yeah, 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 no, well done, well done. That'll bode well for your future in politics, Steve, I'm sure. Thank nice you, Chris. One. Nice one. Good. Now, another, another, another subject matter and something that we've spoken on the podcast um, to lots of people who are in this particular sector is the private private jet which is has got huge opportunities ahead of it and, and one point that came up on a discussion last week is the number of touch points of an individual going through the, the standard commercial travel as opposed to private jet and with all the fears and everything that's happening now you know it's something that so many more people are taking into consideration and even on shorter routes where there, there wouldn't have been a first class option but even on business class now people are looking to get together like two families or people that know each other so that they, they understand the same sort of values when they're on the aircraft and now it's becoming a it, well it's becoming a much much more stronger market than ever anticipated before and as the lockdowns and the restrictions and everything else happens it's going to be private jet uh, travel that's possibly going to do very, very, very well for the next year. I'm, I'm more than happy to join you on your private jet, Chris. I, I would happily, I, from what I've seen now, I would happily go. But I think, you know, it's it's something where people are valuing their life and risk and also what they want to do. You know, they might be reducing the number of trips they go and, and having a, a much, much more, um, should we say, a wealthy experience or unique experience of which they see value in. Well, they, they could well be. And if, you, if you're fortunate enough to be in, in that league, then you're probably not listening to our podcast. So for our audience, I think it's a, different, it's a different decision that's going to be made. I think this is much more one about risk management rather than risk avoidance. And I think it's up to industry to try to manage it. So whilst these private jet firms might do quite well out of it, um, I, I don't know anybody of you know, my friend group that would be readily running off to order a private jet. Um, you know, uh, may, 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 maybe there are more economical solutions out there that, that are, you know, sort of these fractional ownership schemes or whatever yes. that, you know, yeah, yeah. for companies or whatever, it might be buying time that, that kind of works. But um, I don't, I, you know, it was such a small part of global aviation that I can't see. Also, remember, none of these buggers on their private jets pay airport passenger duty, APD and the like. So are they, are they, are they contributing their fair share? <laughs> You know, to the exchequer and to the economy, and, and paying the airport departure taxes and the passenger service charges, etc. I don't think so. I will sit on the fence there with you because I can see I can see the merits of what they're doing and and why they're doing it. Um, but I do take what you said there. Um, now, some of the benefits of what they're doing, Steve, and some of the initiatives that they're taking, um, especially with the hygiene and issues. I just think that if the whole industry started to come together, and we spoke about collaboration a long time ago, there could be a lot more benefits for everybody. Possibly. I guess, I guess the environmental lobby will have a field day on this one, so maybe we'll let it play out that way. Eight yes. passengers on a, on, a, on a jet versus, versus 320. I think you've got a problem there, but that's just my personal view. Right. Oh dear. I think this is this is one of our first little standoffs, Steve, in all these in all these no, weeks. No, I just I just I look, I think I think the days of the days of flashing the cash in private jets for a lot of businesses was long gone. If you're a high net worth individual or you're a high security kind of target, then I get that. I, I just I just I just think you see, yeah, okay, you might you might think, oh it's high risk going to an airport. Actually, I I I, I personally don't think it is the right control measures in place. I think if you look at some of the numbers indexed to death rates per 100,000, whatever the COVID, you will find many more diseases out there that, 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 that we're used to dealing with. I've said this before, polio. Uh, yes, yes, uh, dengue, yes. And, and you're going to say dengue fever. Of course I am, because I had it. Yes. So, so look, let, let's, let's, let's be realistic that we've got to have, you know, let's not take a sledgehammer to, to crack a walnut. We've got to be, we've got to be measured and reasonable. I think um, fixing, my focus in, uh, is helping fix our part of commercial aviation 
It's not. Yeah, it's, yeah. Not, it's not the fill, fill the pockets some private jet operator. No, 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 no. But 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 also, I think I think there there's, there is a, there is a, an argument the other way as well, whereby people just readily assume that everybody like you 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 yourself said flash in the cash. But in some cases, private aviation and you travel more. I, I didn't. I don't know many people who used to travel more than myself, apart from you, apart from you. And if you look at the amount of hours that you have had, not necessarily wasted, but occupied, that could have been used better. And then you look at, you know, you look at some top executives who who do a tough job, okay. And and the amount of extra days that they can gain back, I, I something between that. thirty-five and fifty days a year. And what they can do with that amount of time? You imagine if I gave you an extra thirty-five to fifty I, days. So I'm, I'm not. So I'm saying, so, uh, you know, at, at the high net worth level, or you know, for key kind of uh, leading figures in industry, um, you know, uh, or for you know, for I guess for security purposes, I've got no objection. In fact, I, 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 I happily welcome because when you're on my flight, you're a pain in the arse because you've got security and all sorts of nonsense going on. So get on your private jet, no issue. The, my, my point is that I think as a general rule of thumb. You know, it's, the, the environmental lobby is going to be going to be difficult. I think for corporate business, where you know they've laid off tens of thousands of people, to then see their CEO, it might be cheaper with the CEO and six other executives going in a private jet. Because, but optically, is that the right thing when they've laid off fifteen thousand staff? Some of the banks, this, the big businesses, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Point. Steve, Steve, this is, but this is where I'm coming. This is what I'm coming from. Optically, yes, but it's also the way it's presented. And my point is that there's so much misrepresentation because of passion and because of fear <laughs> and because of problems that if it was more open and if it was more constructive, and I know for a fact, I know for a fact that you work so much when you're on flights, but subject to the comfort of the seat that you might be in also dictates the value that you're able to achieve. So what I'm saying is if people were a little bit more transparent and a little bit more receptive, yes, certain there's a big number of people that are losing jobs. But if some of these executives are able to help that reduction by being more effective and, and some of the meetings, even, even on the best of carriers, you know, they talk yeah. about meeting space and everything, but there's a certain amount of confidentiality and security of open meetings, etc. So I just think that there is a lot more, a lot more um, space for both now to operate and support each other and learn from each other. So that, that, that's, that, that's cool. Now, something I do want to touch base with you, which I think is absolutely terrible and disgusting. If you look at these, these um, news snippets that are coming out now about, you know, hacking and especially hacking with regards to, you know, vaccine development, that is unacceptable. What on earth is the world coming to? Yeah, you'd think, you would think that, um, you would think that, uh, you know, that there was a, there was a moral obligation <laughs> For, for these hackers or whomever nasty jokers are out there doing this kind of thing to actually have some have some have some faith and have some 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 you know uh, integrity. Um, interestingly, I saw sort of a parallel to this. I read an article. A friend of mine um, is South African, and yeah. um, she was telling me that the that the gangs in Joburg, who normally are pretty pretty you know, prevalent and busy. You know South Africa quite well, Chris. Oh, yeah. yeah um, um, you know, with looting and managing their sort of their, 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 their areas, their, their little sort of um, regions of control through, you know, drugs trafficking and whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, uh, they, they basically downed tools and downed arms during the, during the early set of COVID um, uh, crisis. And they did that because the communities that they were protecting or protected by um were unable to kind of move about the normal business because of lockdown yep. and so they decided that they their trafficking routes which they'd normally been using were now going to be used to bring in food and water and all sorts of stuff into the into the um into the uh, the, the housing area so i, I, I look I, i'm not i'm not i'm not um sort of uh, suggesting that that gang crime pays however there are some decent crim criminals out there on the other occasion but Steve, Steve, you said like I do know it very well there, and also that side of things. What they're also doing is they're securing their pipelines for the future as well. Oh, I, I'm so, not you know what I'm saying. Yeah, of course. But but, but whatever yeah. whatever good comes from whatever reason, then that's uh, yeah, that that's important. Right, yeah. my friend. Listen, so just very briefly, so a little a little snippet of hopefully what's going to come in one or two weeks. 
um, this this care concept and also the keeping people involved in the industry and some training issues. We we you know we hope to be um, be able to talk about something positive there over the next few weeks. But as always, Steve. Okay, or should I call you Dano now from Hawaii Five O? Um, it's always a pleasure, and um, I, I look forward to our Saturday sessions. And um, I think now that we've had our relationship first little, um, I don't know how to call it. I don't know what to call it because it's the first time it's happened. But oh, look, it, look, 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 it's still enjoyable. It's still good. And it shows that we don't agree on everything. Absolutely. And life would be very boring if we agreed on everything, Chris. Um, I just wanted to quote one, one chat, my quote of the week. So there's no, there's no tip of the week this week, but there's a, there's a quote of the week. Um, uh, and it's from a gentleman by the name of um, Butros Butros, who is the, um, the uh, communications uh, senior vice president for Emirates. And he said, um, you know, all this talk of um, social distancing inside the aircraft is nice, but we would like to go back to normal. And I think that's a very good little uh, phrase for us to, um, to, to, to finish on. Yeah. And we will continue looking for these planned positives. Indeed. Was it, Deb, was it Debbie that asked that right at the outset? Yes. And because, Steve, why? Because we care. Yeah. Indeed. Now, seriously. Indeed. And I know how Best much of luck you to do. Everyone. Yeah. I know how much you do. Thanks so much, mate. Have a great week. And I'll speak to you soon. Thanks, Chris. Cheers. Cheers. And good luck with cleaning up the mess, my friend. Thank you. <laughs>